Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining the Clallam EDC Coffee Chat, Coffee with Colleen. We're happy to have you here today, and we are really pleased to have Martin Brewer on to join us to talk about the Port Angeles School District's uh, levy that they are pursuing in bonds. So, um, uh, just a few housekeeping items before we kick it off. Uh, if you'll keep yourself on mute so we don't inadvertently get any background noise, and I'll put you on mute if uh, I note that you're off mute in unintentionally. And if you have any questions, uh, what we like to do is have it kind of interactive. Um, and so I'll be watching if you want to raise your hand and ask a question. Uh, we're happy to do that, and I'll call on you, or Marty can call on, call on you. Alternatively, if you just want me to ask your question, you can put a question in the chat, and I'll ask it on your behalf. So with that, I am going to pass it off to Marty. And again, Marty, Nolan, Steve, everyone, thanks so much for joining this morning. Take it away. All right. Thank you very much, Colleen. I we appreciate the opportunity to speak um, on behalf of the school district today. As noted, uh, Nolan Deuce, the Director of Maintenance and Facilities, will be with us today. And also Steve Methner, which is leading the PACE initiative, will be here. And we do also have Rebecca Miller um, sharing some information today as well. So with that being said, let me share my screen here. Thumbs up if you can see my screen. Yep. All Looks right. Good. So um let's see here. So on the November 5th the ballot, we have two propositions. Um, and we want to make sure that the voters clearly understand the difference between the two. Proposition one is the renewal of the um, educational programs and operations levy. If you've been around for a while, that used to be called the M&O levy. Um, and uh, this, this levy is uh, meant to um, address operational needs beyond the state funding model. Um, and this particular levy, if, if um, authorized by the voters, would be a four-year levy collections to be uh, collected in the years uh, 26 through 29. Um, proposition two is a bond to replace and renovate deteriorating schools and improve safety. The projects that we will uh, address if we are successful in this campaign would be the Franklin Elementary School replacement, it would be a renovation of the Performing Arts Center at Port Angeles High School, and it would replace several of the um, individual buildings up at Port Angeles High School to build one large campus. This would be a 20-year bond, um, and it would be a total of $140 million if authorized by our tax base. The important piece here is um, this these both of these taxes replace existing taxes. So if, um, if one thing that I want the listeners to hear today is these aren't um, additional taxes beyond on top of those, because in 2025, at the end of the calendar year, both the capital projects levy and the EPO expire. And so the bond and the new EPO would take place in the spring of 2026. So I want to talk a little bit about um, Proposition 1 and EPNO levy. Again, this is enrichment programs, intended to be enrichment programs in our community and, and our school community. A little bit about it. Uh, one, we've had successful um, campaigns and endeavors for our EPNO levy since the 1960s. Um, uh, EPNO levy must be approved by local tax base. We do so every four years on a cycle. It requires a 50% plus one majority to pass. And, um, you know, our current EPO will be, EPNO will be expiring in 2025. The total collected over the four years would be $34,736,896. So then what does that pay for? Um, so Washington schools, not just Port Angeles, all Washington schools rely on local EPNO levies um, because, again, they provide enrichments to the educational system. Hello. Hi. Sorry and, about that. I'm going to get on mute. There you go. In Port Angeles, um, some of the critical functions of our EPNO, one, um, it funds 
you know, I can never really say a hundred percent because, you know, a hundred percent is, 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 um, all, um, there are some fees that students pay in athletics, but it covers 99.9% .9 of the cost uh, associated to running our athletic program. It also funds 99.9% uh, .9 of the music program. And I know this is near and dear to the heart of everyone in the community. Um, it, it funds almost in its entirety the uh, orchestra, band, and choir programs at all three levels within our school system. It also backfills um, some other programs that, you know, the state funding model just doesn't quite need, uh, meet what the need is in our schools. Um, you know, we hire additional nurses out of our EPNO levy. Uh, we are funded uh, for our entire student body. We are funded by the state prototypical model, uh, three nurses. And so that's really difficult when you're talking, um, you know, three plus thousand students um, and trying to meet their health needs with three nurses. So we do backfill that with some EPNO dollars. We've hired additional counselors. The prototypical funding model has been more responsive at the state level over the last several years um, with regards to allocating state resources for counselors, but we do have some uh, um, uh, experiences within our system where we do hire additional counselors to meet students' needs and demands. Um, transportation continues to be not quite fully funded at the state level, so we do backfill some of our transportation dollars. So I think we've seen this. I think we saw this. Sorry about that. I'll make sure everybody stays on mute. Okay. And then um, we also uh, fund some social workers. We've started a navigator program in our system, and um, really this... this uh, uh, is the basis of, you know, students can't come to school ready to learn if they're dealing with significant challenges in their home life, um, you know, with regards to food insecurities, a lack of housing, et cetera. So the Navigator program in our district really works to help families address those issues. So when, that stu when students come to school, he or she can learn. And then finally, the last one that I skipped there is kind of my pet peeve. Um, you know, the state constitution, which is special education, the state constitution requires a uh, state legislature to fully fund basic education. When a child qualifies for special education, this becomes their basic education. The state um, continues to put a cap on uh, special ed funding. In this case, it's now at 16 percent. Um, and that is 60% of our total student body. And so, uh, quite frankly, we uh, have more than 16%. In fact, last year we uh, approached 20%. So that left 4% of our students unfunded. And that comes at a cost of nearly $2 million by our um, system to support the needs of basic education through special ed programs. And so beyond this campaign, as we move into the next legislative session, I would certainly appreciate everybody on this call or listening to this um, would uh, help advocate to, to help our legislators understand the need to fully fund special education. It's not my um, rule, it's the state constitution. And so your help there would be much appreciated. So now we're gonna transition into the other side of the house. That was the operational side. Now we'll move into the capital side. So um, uh, Five years ago, we um, introduced the 30-year facilities plan, and I think this plan is really critical because the, the needs of the facilities of the Port Angeles School District are, are high. And without a plan uh, and logically trying to, to fund that plan, quite frankly, we could fall behind and fall behind so far that um, we don't have the, the bonding capacity um, to, to make, up, make up the difference. So... Um, when I came to town uh, in 2018, I spent the first six months on the job reviewing um, a decade's worth of great work by our by our district and our community assessing the needs of Port Angeles School District. I also spent about the first six months on the job doing what I called um, coffee with the superintendent. Um, and um, many of the folks in the room and across the community took that opportunity to come in and speak with me about you know what port angeles is doing well uh what we needed to improve upon and then finally why we struggle to you know uh, um, support capital campaigns in our community 
out of those, out of that listening and review of all the documents from previous years, um, three came, three things came to the surface. One, um, we need to maximize state dollars. This community expects us to do everything we can to maximize uh, the state dollar and um, you know reduce the local costs as much as possible. Number two provide a long range performance based plan with a consistent rate and this was a, a really really great feedback to me around you know the it, it folks on a fixed income and having the inconsistencies of tax rates going up and down it's hard to plan and so uh you know we we have worked really hard in our district to try to address that concern also um out of those conversations came the long range plan and i think that's that's been a real benefit to our district and hopefully our community and then finally we need to do the very best we can to minimize the burden on local taxpayers um, that is expected from my listening and review of uh, materials throughout the decades so our commitment and focus on facilities, um, here you can see, this, is, this really defines the reason why we need to have a plan. If you take a look at um, the left-hand side there, you can see that Franklin Elementary School was built in 1954. Uh, Hamilton in 56, Stevens in 60, Port Angeles High School was originally built in 53 and had a renovation in 78, Roosevelt 78. So without a plan, quite frankly, because this is hundreds of millions of dollars worth of work, if we can't, if we don't have a plan and try to execute that plan, we could fall so far behind. And I've said it many times, if we fall further behind, the leaders of the next generation won't have solutions. And so we need to do our very best to try to try to execute this plan and stay um, uh, where we need to be as far as our capital needs are concerned. Um, planning for the future, you know, we we created the 30-year long-term facilities plan. We're going to talk about that today. And I want to, just as I do every time I speak in the community, I want to thank our voters of the community for funding phase one of um, the capital projects plan. So here's the same thing in an illustration form. Um, it, if you've um, been on the website or part of the previous campaign, this is not new to you. So this is um, phase one uh, was in 2020, funded the Stevens Middle School mo uh, project. I want, Nolan's going to reference this a little later in the presentation, but we are on time and on budget. Um, and I know there's a little bit of pushback in the community around, well, wait, we, wait, we've been paying taxes for four plus years and we don't have anything in the ground at Stevens. Well, that's exactly what um, we communicated that as, because we are not bonding this, we're not bearing interest with regards to this project, we're collecting the funds annually. And right now, as of a few weeks ago, we had $37 million in the county treasurer's office waiting and uh, waiting to collect the remaining funds through the end of next calendar year, and then the project will, uh, will begin. Um, phase two, which is where we're at today in 2025, uh, funds a portion of Port Angeles High School and also Franklin Elementary School. And there you can see the remaining phase. Phase three would be the second phase or the that's the second part of the funding model for Port Angeles High School. Phase four would be element, uh, Hamilton Elementary and phase five would be Roosevelt. I want to like spend just a second talking about the phase four. I'm going to go back to the previous slide. Here you can see Franklin was built, or excuse me, Hamilton was built in 1956. And then going to best case scenario, if we can execute this plan and all of the variables work out as we predicted them to do so, and no plan goes that path, but under best case circumstances, we can fund uh, Hamilton Elementary School in 2037. So that's um, that that really defines the reason why I think we need to have a plan, try to stick to that plan and execute the best we can. Nolan's going to speak a little bit about the fundamentals of the plan. Go ahead, Nolan. Yeah, good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, first of all, our, our district is going to move back to a K5, 6, 8, 9, 12 district. Currently, we're, we're uh, K6. And so um, we're going to have the sixth graders go up to the middle school and, uh, and again, try to get the kids out of the portables at, at all levels. Um, we're addressing the facilities with the highest needs. Uh, every student in Port Angeles goes through Stevens Middle School. Every student in Port Angeles will go through Port Angeles High School. Um, and so those are, the, those are the two at the top. And then Franklin uh, has uh, huge needs. Um, and you'll hear this multiple times during the, the presentation. We're trying to keep a consistent tax rate. 
uh, voters get to come back every five or six years along our timeline and, uh, and let us know how we did uh, based on performance. Um, we're trying to maximize the state grants that are out there and available, and you'll see a slide later on that we're doing that. Uh, we're trying to make our schools safe, and, and again, we're, uh, we're working through a committee that uh, has a lot of um, input on how the Port Angeles uh, district moves forward. Next slide, please. So phase one was a capital levy. Uh, first thing that we did is we built uh, safety vestibules for all the elementary school, and so and they really work. Uh, it used to be that you could walk through our front doors and walk right into the classroom spaces and nobody could could uh, could approach you before you were there. Uh, that has stopped. Now you walk in the front doors and you have to um, talk to the uh, secretary before you can move through and um, and it just uh, keeps it uh, way safer for for um, the single point entries. Uh, the Monroe Playfield, if you haven't been there, you need to. It's a fantastic facility. Uh, we, uh, um, we tried to uh, make the contract so the local work could get part of this contract. We, uh, we did the uh, civil work as a one bid package and we did the turf work as a second bid package. And so we tried to keep as much local work as we possibly could. Uh, we also got a walking path around it. And, um, and we've got some picnic tables. And so a fantastic place to, uh, to go and have your lunch or walk or, or watch one of the sports teams that are on it. I will say that uh, we even, uh, we added a shock pad on our field and not many fields have shock pads. And, and what it does is it's just one more layer of, of protection from catastrophic head and neck injuries. So uh, we did pay the extra money for it. And, and again, safety is a high priority at Port Angeles. And then we're constructing a new middle school. Um, I'll talk about that in a little bit. But when we were uh, went through the process of, uh, of constructing a new middle school, we decided to go GCCM, which is we're hiring a general contractor, which we have FORMA. But during that process, we um, one of the questions that we asked all the, the, um, the people who submitted was, how much work do you plan on self-performing? And that's a big deal to us because, again, we want to see local work uh, on this project. So uh, Forma's answer was they were going to be doing foundation works, windows, some carpentry, but they were going to keep it at about 14 percent, and which is fantastic. Rebecca, do you want to add a little bit of context to that around the work that you're doing with Forma to promote local subs? Absolutely. Um, we're really excited about this. In fact, Yesterday, Justine and I were at a convention in Tacoma and Forma was there, had a really great talk with them. Um, I'm really impressed that the school district is making such um, a push for Forma, the prime contractor, to hire locals. And I have to say, I really believe that they're putting their money where their mouth is. We're doing a open house for them to meet local contractors on October 24th at Red Lion Hotel. They are paying for everything. All they've asked me to do is to get a bunch of people there. So um, if you know any local contractors who would like in um, on the possibility of this job and to meet the prime, please let me know and we'll send you an invitation to it. Uh, I am... You know, today happens to be Apex Accelerator Day. It's a national holiday. I don't know why I didn't get the day off. I think we all should take the day off. Um, but it's I really appreciate the um, the opportunity just to remind people that I am here. Justine Wagner, um, our counselor, is on the call as well, and um, we are happy to help make these local projects be a winner for our local contractors as well. So thank you so much, Marty. And I saw Regan on the phone. I had a opportunity to talk to her last Thursday night. And um, I'm, I'm just very grateful that we are seeing how important it is for our local economy to share all of this money that's coming in from outside. And Thanks this so is, much. Oh, 
Thank you, Rebecca, for that. Um, and this is one of the top priorities of the school board with regards to this contract. Um, when we interviewed uh, our GCCM candidates, um, that was first and foremost. You know, how can you work with the school district to promote and help, you know, our local subs gain work, you know, and uh, so I could not be more impressed with Forma's uh, response to that. And um, I agree with Rebecca. I believe they're putting their money where their mouth is and they're doing the work. And if, uh, you know, and that that likely will not change, but we won't allow it to change at the at the local level. So thank you. That's great to hear. If I can add just a couple things, explain a few things that some general contour general contractors are signatories to unions so they have to hire certain types of contractors that are union contractors and while that is great the issue we have locally is that it's we have very very few union contractors here in our county um and i we just at the edc we finally got uh, approval for a data sharing agreement with Department of Revenue. And so we now finally have a list of all, uh, all businesses in Clallam County. And it was, I'm, I'm just starting to go through the list. There are some duplications, but there are 9,700 entries. Um, and they are duplications because some businesses have two uh, locations or two, um, doing business as names. And, but what I found remarkable was 15% of those businesses were in the construction industry. So a huge number of Clallam County businesses are contractors. I'm sure the vast majority of them are one person with, you know, no employees, but, you know, it, it makes up such a huge portion of our uh, economy here, and yet a, a very small handful of those, you know, 1,300 or so businesses are union. And so by make, you know, reaching out to um, the local contractors, we'll, without the requirement for them to be union, will allow a lot more local contractors to be engaged in these really lucrative contracts. Thank you. All right, well, I'll keep going here on the, the middle school. So this is a picture of our middle school. I would invite everybody to uh, view the, the board meeting on Thursday. Uh, our uh, architect, um, Integris, is going to go through the, the project in more detail. But uh, what you're seeing here is the brand new building is off to the right. Um, it's a, the C-shaped building. Uh, it's a, a little over 84,000 square feet of educational space. Uh, that building, and it's not showing it here, but that building will be linked to the gym uh, so that there will be uh, a covered walkway to get to it. Uh, the gym is going to get a full makeover. We're, we're doing a modernization of the gym and uh, the music room was uh, was built in 2004 so it's there as well uh, the old school we're going to continue to uh, house the kids and, and teach in the school while the new school is being built and then when the new school is built uh, we'll take down the old school uh, where the old school is or where the school is currently uh, you're seeing some bus drop off um, I'd like to point out that red dot right in the middle of the of the uh, picture uh, that's the main entrance and so that's where you're going to be coming in that that um, off to the right is the bus drop off and visitor parking. And then we've got secured. Um, we've got secured uh, playgrounds for the kids, uh, half court uh, concrete uh, for basketball. We've got uh, also a, uh, a turf area and we've got a grass area that's kind of an amphitheater, but it's all again secured area. Um, and we've uh, we've started this project uh we're we're getting really close to the final um the uh, uh, dd is is work so we've gone through schematic design we've gone through um value engineering um and so we're getting really close to having our 75 percent prints ready and again um we're on time and on budget 
Yeah. Um, in fact, we're we're navigating right now that some of the bid packages will be launched and executed starting this next summer in 2025. So um, we're really excited to to get to work as well. And so the the phase or the proposition to our bond is again the high school and the Franklin Elementary School in the auditorium. Yeah. Next slide. Oops. So uh, Franklin and the high school, again, they're over 70 years old um, and uh, they're really well-aged, but they're showing their needs. And, and when we talk about it, we're not talking about paint on the walls or, or wax on the floors. What we're talking about is the major systems, the mechanical system, the plumbing system, the, the electrical system, the foundations, the roofing system. So um, the fire safety systems. I mean, all of those go into the scores of how the buildings are evaluated and, and what buildings we should be doing first. And um, again, we we do a lot right now. There, um, there's no leaks in the build in the district. As they come up, we fix them, um, and and we stay on it. But um, they they are well aged. Next slide, please. So, what are you going to get if this bond passes? And and this is what you're going to get. So all the blue buildings will be replaced and taken down when the new building is built. Uh, just like Stevens, we're going to uh, house the kids in the buildings until the new building is finished, and then we'll start removing them. But from the top left, um, the big long building, it's a 100 building, it's admin and classroom spaces. Uh, a lot of our, um, our chemistry, science, a lot of those are in that building. The 200 building is all music. So that building will be replaced. The 300 building is our cafeteria, special needs programs, um, and then a couple of classroom spaces. The 400 building is our library and more classroom spaces. Uh, the 900 building is all classrooms. There's 20 classrooms in that building. And then the 600 building is all our science buildings. So all of those will be incorporated into one building down on the uh, the northeast side of the, the property. The bronze buildings that you're seeing are our next phase. Uh, we can't do it all in one bond, so we're uh, we're going to come back. The two bronze buildings that are really close together, uh, the smaller square one is the uh, 800 building, and it's the auto body uh, machine shop. Fantastic spaces, huge spaces. Most vocational spaces are not this big, and so they're really a gem for the, the Port Angeles School District. And the 500 building, uh, that's the same. We've got our wood shop program, which the space is, is just, it's, it's great. Uh, you don't see spaces like that being built around the state very often. And uh, we also have auto body welding, uh, drafting. There's a lot of vocational programs in that building. So those are the two close together. And then our gym is the one at the, at the very bottom of the screen. And again, those will all be phase three of the projects. No, and you want to reference the, the auditorium? Yes, um, the, so the auditorium in green is also one of the projects here. Uh, the auditorium was bonded in uh, 1958 and built, and it's a fantastic space. It holds over 1,100 people in it, uh, and it's, it's the biggest in Port Angeles by far. Uh, even with a new uh, field hall center, it doesn't hold nearly what the auditorium does. And the acoustics in there are fantastic. Uh, it's, it's just a great space, but again, it's well-aged. Uh, it was, when I said it was built in the 58, um, ADA didn't come along until the early 1990s. And so there's a lot of needs for accessibility in that, uh, that facility. Um, and we'll take care of all that. We'll make restrooms that actually work for big performances. Uh, and then we'll just make the accessibility um, work. And again, uh, provide a state-of-the-art auditorium uh, performing our center for the community. So where the dotted line is, is where we think the new building will go. Um, and so we, we're not exactly sure. Again, um, the, when the bond passes, you can do more work, more geotech work to see exactly where is the best spot for it's going to be. But we think it's going to be somewhere in that area right there, and, and it'll be multi-story. Yeah, and um, the thing I want to draw the listeners' attention to here is this is a 40-acre campus. 
Uh, it was built in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and it's an open campus. And open campuses for educational systems, high schools, used to be the thing. Um, with security measures in today's world and, unfortunately, security threats in today's world, this campus, um, you know, I am very frank and honest, is uh, nearly impossible, if not impossible, to um, control access to. In, um, you know, being a 40-acre campus, a threat can come on that campus anywhere in that 360 degree circle around our campus. Our students walk um, outdoor transitions from the gym to the 100 building and across the campus multiple times a day. The accessibility by the public and somebody that has come onto that campus to do harm is incredibly high. We have 147 exterior doors that are open at all time times. That is not 21st century safety metrics. And I, I share just a personal story around this. I graduated from Grandview High School in 1984. When I was a freshman in 1980, I opened up a new high school, or I didn't open it up, but I was the first freshman class to attend that high school. It was an open campus, same size as, as Port Angeles in central Washington. Um, very poor community, agriculturally based community. So in 1980, that campus opened up as an open campus. Four years ago, that campus was replaced um, with a new, um, you know, single point of entry uh, uh, campus. So, um, you know, what we see here in an open campus, 40 acres, totally exposed, is not the norm anymore. It just, quite frankly and simply, is are, is not. Go ahead, Nolan. And so this is the auditorium. It's a great picture of it. Um, what you're seeing there is the uh, Juan de Fuca Festival of the Arts, and the performer is on stage, and that's uh, half of our elementary population, a couple of schools. Um, there's definitely the have and have-nots in Port Angeles, and we have a lot of free and reduced, and sometimes these are the only times that, that some of the students get to see some of the performances. And so having a, an auditorium that's that big is really a... a um, a fantastic uh, opportunity for the district to do things like this. Um, the part of the bond will be again $30 million towards this facility and we'll renew it uh, and make it just state of the art again. Um, so Franklin uh, is probably the school with the biggest needs. And again, when I go back to that, it's the it's the systems, it's the electrical system, the plumbing system, the um, the mechanical, the foundations, uh, they, it just has a lot of needs. It's well-aged, it was built in 54, and it's just at the end of its useful life. And uh, we need to renew this school. Um, and it, um, it's a fantastic school. We do good things in it, but it's just at the end of its useful life. All right, so now I wanna talk about estimated tax rates and cost. Um, coming back to re remember some of our operating principles around our capital plan. One, we wanna maximize state dollars. Two, consistent local tax rate. Three, minimize the burden as best we can on our local, local taxpayers. So with that being said, here's um, what we anticipate in the form of state match, um, grants, SCAP funding, however you want to reference it. The renovation and the replacement of the buildings at Port Angeles High School will run us $133.5 million. The Franklin Elementary School replacement will be $43 million for a total project cost of $176,500,000. We do anticipate that we would qualify for upwards of $36.5 million in state funding to help us with this work. So again, for a commitment of $140 million locally, we can do well over $175 million worth of work. The important piece here is these grants that we're talking about, SCAP funding, state match, however you want to reference it, the only way we qualify for those grants is to have a local um, commitment. And so if, if our local community steps up and says, this is a project that we want to support, it opened up, opens up the opportunity for us to apply for grants of this nature. 
So back in 2019, 2020, we came around to the community and we presented this slide. And I want to present this as a form of accountability. So in 2014, um, we, we ran a high school initiative. I believe it was for $114 million at that time. Um, our EPNO rate was $3.20. The high school bond was $2.19 for a combined total of $5.39. Uh, in 2018, we came back to the tax base, tax base and our EPNO was 301. We presented a $2.47 increase or uh, capital projects levy for the Stevens Middle School project for a combined total of four, uh, excuse me, 548. That did not pass. In 2020, we came back to our tax base and we capped our EPNO to $1.50 and we asked for a 262 rate for the Stevens project for a combined total of $4.12. That did pass. We thank again our community for stepping up and funding that project. So this is the accountability measure. Did we deliver? Um, you know, in 2021, you can see the combined total, $4.03, 22, 23. In 2024, uh, our combined total this year is $2.81. And finally, 2025, the last year of collections for the capital projects levy and also the EPNO is scheduled to be about 272. So this is one side of the house as it relates to um, you know, establishing the rate. Moving forward, um, and I've said this often, win, lose, or draw this election. I hope that this community is appreciative of the board leadership in trying to keep a consistent tax rate. Because if in you know the, the board has established a, established a new normal moving forward of a combined rate of $2.70. If we went back five years and said, well, we have the capacity to go up to 412 because that's what we told our voters, that would be a massive increase for every taxpayer in our community. That's not what we're looking to do. So we've redefined what our cap is at $2.70. Here you can see that our um, capital projects levy in 2026 will be at $1.40. So we're increasing that a little bit on the operational side. Again, a big portion or a big reason for that is our SPED costs have gone up 400% since 2020. Um, and so we need more operational dollars, but we've lowered our capital. Spend act. being special education. I'm sorry. Yes. Spend being special. Yeah. Yes. Special education has, has gone up 400% for our district. So um, we've you know, asked a little more on the EPNO side, but we've asked a little less on the capital side. And so uh, again, um, I hope this community is appreciative of the board trying to control, you know, that tax rate that, you know, is, is um, you know, uh, to uh, sent or uh, shared with our, with our um, taxpayers. Um, and then finally, uh, Steve, do you want to talk about this uh, chart, please? Sure. Um, every, every time I look at this chart, you know, a question forms in my mind and, and the question sounds kind of like if, if you could replace most of our aging middle school, uh, replace all of the instructional buildings at the high school, remodel the auditorium, rebuild Franklin Elementary, and stay the course for a 30 year total renewal of all of our schools, all without an additional tax burden, would you do that? And to me, that seems like a no brainer. Um, th this uh, chart um, is kind of a worst case scenario estimate of what the cost for the average homeowner would be in Port Angeles uh, between now and 2029. Some of it gets highly technical and it's slightly unknowable because um, interest rates at the federal level do tend to drive what municipal bond um, rates will be. But with what the Federal Reserve has done recently in cutting um, uh, the federal funds rate, um, uh, this chart might change a little bit. But before any interest rate decreases occurred recently, this uh, is the projection for what the burden would be for the average homeowner. So you can see in 2023, it was $1,250 for a $410,000 house. It, it actually fell in uh, 2024. And even as home values increase uh, over time, the average homeowner would see about a $42 change um, in their overall tax burden between now and 2029. And that's based on um, interest rates as they were before they were cut. So um, this projection might change a bit. Uh, it might actually slant the line the other direction. 
but a $42 change between now and 2029 seems like a pretty good deal. So um, I think th this is this sort of speaks to how um, strictly the, the board and Marty have tried to conform to this, uh, the, the, what the taxpayers were saying uh, as he started to sort of um, uh, get a feel for the landscape uh, when, he, when he came in 2018. Um, and that's that um, uh, Port Angeles said yes to this uh, long-term plan in 2020. Um, and um, the promise needs to be kept that the taxes will remain consistent. Uh, and I think this shows, and, and what Marty and Nolan have been saying, is that um, if you could do all this stuff and stay within the budget and allowance that you have, would you do it? And um, the performance metrics are that, that it's happening. Um, it, it's happening on time. They're being a little modest, it's slightly under budget actually at the moment. Um, but uh, you, know, you, do have, uh, you do have some unknowables that will come as well. But this was a promise to voters and taxpayers, and I, I think it's been a tremendous effort by the board and, and by, uh, by Marty and his team to stick to that promise and keep the burdens from increasing once we start on the, on the journey. So the great news is we can do this, uh, and we can do this within um, the budget that we have currently. Um, so, um, and, and one of the big points uh, right now is um, that, you know, in spite of, not in spite of, but but we are here with such a, an exciting and historic opportunity. And we said yes to this plan um, in, in 2020. And, um, and with the middle school, we're deep in the design phase and it's approaching the start of construction activities, hopefully in, in uh, mid, mid or late 2025. Um, but one point that uh, got made uh, recently, too, is that with all of the hurricanes and the natural disasters that are unfolding in our nation, and we're, we're reminded that infrastructure is, is critical. Um, and uh, aside from, you know, other issues around public schools um, and, you know, general, uh, you know, general moods that shift around public schools, one of the things that is clear in the research is renewal of facilities is uh, is key when it comes to um, uh, starting to spur enrollment again, starting to uh, be able to recruit again. Um, uh, actually, disciplinary problems decrease, and it's well studied. Disciplinary problems decrease when we have uh, renewed school facilities. So we have this great opportunity to sort of uh, attack all of these problems that we have, our, our aging facilities, our 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 lack of modern safety standards at, at uh, particularly at our high school um, and the, the general malaise around public schools and uh, declining enrollment, um, morale, um, all of that stuff. Um, one of the fundamental ways to attack that stuff is, is facility renewal. Um, there is no magic uh, solution to all of this stuff, but this is, this is well studied that this is definitely the place to start. And we can do it in the budget we have. So I'm pretty excited about this whole thing. I've been working on this stuff. It seems like most of my adult life. Um, so, um, and one of the bigger um, points here with school uh, measures in particular, this is not at the case with all public taxation, but with school measures, they're a fixed dollar amount. So um, a certain number of dollars is requested um, by the measure. And that number of dollars is fixed. So as your uh, property values go up, uh, your collection rates um, go down. So what that means is if you pay $10 a year based on your house and somebody builds a house next door, the burden is spread to that new homeowner um, or that new building. And so you actually will pay less because the district is only collecting the same number of dollars. So the more we can spur growth in town, um, the more we spread um, uh, the burden among uh, all of the new structures that are built as well. So historically, rates tend to go down for school levies and school bond measures, um, if you look generally speaking. Uh, and that has been the case in Port Angeles as well. If you were to look at your own um, uh, tax records over time, uh, consistently over years or back over decades, uh, your, your levy burden goes down each year even as your property value goes up each year. Um, and that's likely to be the case with bonds as well if we can spur growth um, and, um, and, and construction in town.
Thank you, Steve. So if if passed, Proposition One and Proposition Two will um, Proposition One will fund um, all of our you know programs that are near and dear to our heart, our athletic programs, music programs, student supports, and backfill our special ed um, population. And Proposition Two will um, authorize the school district to bond up to four hundred and forty million dollars to do a full replacement of Franklin Elementary School, a new instructional wing at Port Angeles High School that increases security and has a single point of entry, and renovate the Performing Arts Center. And here's my favorite slide. Um, this this really um, uh, adheres to the vision. Um, and if if we execute this campaign in a positive measure um, in fall of 2028, this community will open up a new Franklin Elementary School, a new Port An or a new Performing Arts Center at Port Angeles High School, which is a renovation, uh, a large new single point of entry campus at Port Angeles High School and uh, Stevens Middle School will actually open up about a year early, earlier than that. But this is real progress. And as Steve referenced um, in his uh, comments, um, you know, one of the driving forces behind uh, enrollment and recruitment, um, and we hear this from the hospital board often, but it's not always about all the doctors. It's about families looking for new homes and looking for a new place to live. Um, the first thing they're going to do is drive by the schools. And quite frankly, when you drive by Port Angeles High School, it doesn't give a good warm feeling. And it doesn't help us to recruit. We can't even get into the conversations around how our students perform um, because, you know, they just the facility is a non-starter. So I believe, and this is my opinion now, that we invest in ourselves and we start investing in our schools this way, we will see um, increased enrollment. Families will choose this area. Doctors will choose this area to, to relocate and uh, become a part of this uh, wonderful community. So with that, we're asking that um, everyone, you know, please consider, you know, voting on the November 5th election. Your ballots will be out sometime between the 18th uh, or sometime approximately the October 18th. And um, uh, we'll, op we'll be open to any questions you might have. Great. Thank you so much. I see Susie Ames has her hand raised. Dr. Ames, please. Hi there. Um, just wanted to congratulate uh, the school district team and Marty for putting together such a really solid plan. Um, I just also want to add, if Marty hasn't already said it, there's actually hard science that shows that student academic levels um, excel relative to the quality of building that they learn in. So this is not only going to make things safer and more aesthetically pleasing, um, we will actually see increased um, student success and graduation rates um, as a result. So thank you for your hard work on this. Great, thank you, Susie. Thank you, Susie. Um, and then Jim, had would you put a question in the chat? Would you like to ask that or would you like me to read it? Well, Jim wrote, what is the enrollment assumptions in relationship to the buildings versus current enrollment? Hey, Nolan, do you wanna um, start with that? Yeah, so um, we, when we were designing uh, Stevens, let's start there. Uh, we um, we added headroom for the community to grow, and so we knew that. Uh, and just by looking at the other facilities that have opened up lately, you look at North Mason, you look at the Tribal School out of La Push, you look at uh, Central. When they've opened up new kid new um, facilities, more kids show up on the first day. So we have some headroom at Stevens. Uh, the new high school is being built for um, the educational wing for 930 students, but it's going to support 1,250. Again, it's going to give us a little bit of headroom, but the nine, but and 950 kids can be in that facility. But uh, with still keeping the vocational and keeping the gym, there's going to be other students that need lunches, that need restrooms, they'll need uh, other other facilities. So we're we're sizing it for 1250, but that new wing will house 930. 
Um, so we are giving a little bit of headroom and, and Franklin is going to have a little bit of room as well. So all three levels of our, our school district will have room for growth. And I think that's an important um, concept because, you know, if you build square footage for what you have today, and again, as Nolan referenced, and I think Susie was referencing it as well, um, you know, students will come. And so the last thing this community wants to see, and I've seen it happen historically across communities in Washington state, especially, um, is you open up a new facility, you become, or you then open at capacity. And the next thing you do is you start adding portables. Nobody really wants a portable to set out in front of a new facility. It's, it's, it's not a good look for the community and not a good look for, you know, the, the school system. And it's not, you know, equitable for the, 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 the students. And so we are building um, some capacity uh, for growth um, at all three levels. Thank you. Uh, Jim. Just one follow-up question is, do you have uh, uh, graphs or charts on that? Again, uh, you know, I'm working closely on the Port Angeles comprehensive plan uh, with the association of realtors and also the county's plan. And I think that's that's great information uh, in relationship to how cities and counties are planning for growth in the future. Yeah, Jim, um, I don't currently have anything at um, my fingertips now, but we could work on that for you and get something to you. Absolutely. You send that to me. That'd be great. Thank you. Okay, will do. Thanks, Jim. So Steve DeLeo sent a pretty comprehensive email. He had looked at data as far as enrollment of students. And from 2005 to 2024, I think it was, I can send anybody the, the, um, the he pulled it off of OSP, I believe. The um uh to 2023, I'm sorry, the number, the enrollment of students dropped by 21% during that period, during that time period. So 18 years, 21% in enrollment, while the city's population grew by 1600 people. So, I mean, that does speak to the fact what Dr. Ames and what Marty is speaking to, that at older school will not attract students. They, you know, look for other options. So um, anyway, that the comments that I put from Stephen, he wasn't able to attend today, but um, he had a conflict, but he did wanted to add that that point and uh and he writes, net, net, our demographics have changed as fewer people raise families here. Now, 17% of the city of Port Angeles population are enrolled in school compared to 24% in 2005. That is particularly notable as the population figures also show that the city of Port Angeles is growing at half to a third the rate of the county, excluding the city of Port Angeles. And then he wrote, lastly, I saw another worksheet that showed City of Port Angeles school employees increased nearly 50% from 2013 to 21, while student enrollment fell by 140 students. Um, and talks about his wife, works at, for Jefferson as a paraeducator, so she hears stories on the front line. Our special needs ratio of 20% makes it hard on staff, and I'm sure difficult for parents to decide to send kids to public schools. So his questions were, Given the steady enrollment declines of almost a percent of uh, uh, CAGR, what is that? Grow, I've forgotten what it stands for, sorry. But um, uh, let's see, given that year over year decrease, um, what are your assumptions going forward? Do you think we can get back to the 4,500 students like we had in 2005? That's his first question. Um, you know, I, can we potentially, I think, um, a realistic goal would be, um, you know, recovering to, um, pre COVID numbers. We're still down about 120 FTE from, uh, 2018. Um, so, uh, I think there's a lot of factors. I could do a whole hour on just that one question. I think, you know, the economy around the mill closures obviously impacted this in the early 2000s. Um, currently, the political climate around po uh, public schools, and we get pulled into that political dialogue, and that creates some angst, as Steve referenced, um, and the birth rate's down. 
in our community. And, and we're seeing that in our schools. We're seeing fewer um, primary age students. Um, you know, we still have pretty historic numbers at the secondary level, but our um, primary grades um, have seen a little bit of a decline. And that speaks to, again, I think affordable housing, the economy, and the schools. Mm -hmm. Yep, totally makes sense. And CAGR is combined annual growth rate. Uh, what has been our historical ratio of special needs? All I heard is that we're 20% versus state funding allowance at 16. How can we get more funding for these kids? How do you improve this ratio? Yeah, um, so in 2014, uh, we had 12.5% uh, special ed population. Mm -hmm. Currently, today, right now, um, we have 18%. Um, we historically increased by about a percent during the course of the year. We qualify new students to the program. So my educated guess would lead us to somewhere in that 19 to 20% ratio um, by the end of this school year. Um, and as I referenced in the EPO side of the work, you know, we're, we've seen a 400% increase in our special ed cost um, in our school district for that 4% last year that we're unfunded. We get we have that artificial cap of 16% that the state legislature authorizes, and then our local EPO pays for that additional three or four percent. And um, special ed programs are very um, uh, expensive because you know, they're individualized. I think. Uh, to answer that question, I could really use the help from everybody sitting in this room to reach out to the state legislature and talk to them around like the constitutional duty of fully funding basic ed programs in the state of Washington. It is the constitution and it is the paramount duty of the state. And so we need we need your help, um, you know, with regards to full funding. I think if we could get to a position where we have full funding, that would give us the ability to create more robust robust programs. Um, you know, that additional funding would um, give us the ability to have a hearing impaired program or a, um, a, a student on the spectrum or autistic program, very specialized to the student need. And, um, you know, to, to do those types of very robust and, and expansive programs, we just need the funding to do so. We have the will, the desire, and the commitment to our students and our families here in the Port Angeles School District, but, you know, we need the money to do that work. And so, um, you know, that would be uh, very helpful. Um, I can't remember the second part of the question, Colleen. It was, what? why has it What's driving that increase in um, in percentage? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I I think we have seen a fairly substantial uptick, you know, post COVID, um, and I think that would be related to you know, and and I'm really proud of the Olympic Peninsula and the Port Angeles School District in particular. Um, we brought our students back to school much earlier than the rest of the state um, when it came to COVID closures. But, you know, even that very little time that we were totally out of school, which was three months from the closure in Mar March to the end of the school year, has a huge impact on students that are struggling, um, you know, to navigate virtual systems. And so I think I think COVID hasn't helped us. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, I think there's a direct correlation between, um, you know, uh, students of special needs and, um, you know, family challenges and, um, you know, disadvantaged families. And so, um, quite frankly, how we undo it is we get the money to, you know, from the state to undo it and build very specialized programs for our students to help them close that achievement gap. That's how we do it. And, and right now, when the state turns a blind eye to, hey, those are unfunded students, that's really challenging for us. And it, it, it creates a scenario where we have to make very difficult decisions in our school district and cut, um, you know, enrichment programs on behalf of providing basic ed programming. And that's not right. And so, again, I think we can directly link it to the state needs to, you know, um, fully fund special education so that we can do our constitutional duty and providing the absolute best educational um, uh, offering for every student, including those uh, that have disabilities. 
So we're at 9.01, but I just want to ask the last question. I thought it was an interesting one of Stevens. Will historical staff growth continue despite declines in enrollment? Does it simply take more teachers per child these days? So I, I saw his numbers and and I, I can't, I'll have to do a little research. I, I don't know what's driving that 600, I think it was 646 um uh, staff, um, mm -hmm. you know, we, that number seems high. Um, I think there may be some substitute teachers included in that. Okay. Because typically right now we have a staff of about, uh, we're, we're right around 500, um, okay. total staff, but to answer the question, yes, um, we are investing more in um, staffing as it relates to meeting students' needs than maybe we did 10 years ago. Um, and uh, we provide more social support. We provide more counseling counselors to meet the needs of students. It also is a funding formula ratio as well, because um, the state now requires um, K3 class, excuse me, K2 classes to um, a 17 to one ratio. And so if we don't meet that ratio at the state level, then we get penalized through apportionment. So a part of that is driven by the state funding formula as well. And so uh, we're investing more on the student support services side, but we're also aligning to the state funding side is would be my simple, my quick answer to that question, Colleen. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Marty, Nolan, and Steve for joining us today and giving this really thoughtful presentation. Uh, it's been really helpful and um, we wish you the best of luck in your upcoming um, the upcoming vote. So thank you very enjoy much. Your, thank you, thank enjoy you. your day, everyone. One more, one more thing. Um, yes. We are, Nolan and I and Steve will go out anytime, any place, anywhere. So if anybody in the room has a location that you want us to come and present this uh, presentation, we're game. So uh, please let us know. You can send a direct email to me and uh, we'll get that scheduled. So again, thank you very much. Thank you. And this recording will be up on our website, column.org by the afternoon, if you want to share it with anyone. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.